Very warm welcome to Christ Church for our service of Holy Communion. Please kneel as we begin our service with a brief moment of prayer. O God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand for our opening hymn, Thy Strong Word Did Cleave the Darkness, hymn number 381 in your blue hymnal. Once again, a very warm welcome to you all here to Christ Church for our service of Holy Communion, which begins in your prayer books on page 323, as well as with the opening acclamation printed at the very top of your bulletin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. 
Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I find the words to our Gloria on page 324 and the tune on page S202 of your hymnal. be with you. Let us pray. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us, we beseech thee, the liberty of that abundant life which thou hast manifested to us in thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our lesson. A reading from Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me! I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. The word of the Lord.
a reading from 1 Corinthians. I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I hand it on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The word of the Lord. Please stand for our sequence hymn, Amazing Grace, which you'll find in your blue hymnal number 671. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, o Lord. Once while Jesus was standing by aside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. 
he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he, for he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching people. When they had brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's be seated. When you get asked to do the last thing that you really want to do, um, you don't do it happily, when you're, especially when you're super tired and you see no point in what is being asked of you, and you feel like you know a lot more about um, what's being asked and the person who's doing the asking, and so you make up excuses. We've tried this before. You don't really know exactly what you're asking, everything that's involved, and I'm just tired. I can't do this right now. And that must have been the case for Peter and his fishing crew in today's uh, gospel reading that I just read to you from Luke. In this sermon, I want to focus on the two responses that Peter gives to Jesus in this episode. Um, sit closely to the text and using the illustrations that are provided by this uh, the experience that we just read about. And there's a segue that might not seem obvious between Jesus's, uh, Peter's first response to, Pe to Jesus and his second, but um, I think it's there. So I know you're on the edge of your seats right now. Just hold on. I want to give it to you. So what is the first response? He'd been fishing all night long. So it was after he'd been fishing all night, all night long, and he'd been skunked, meaning there were no fish. And he had his boat on the shore. He was washing his fishing nets. Jesus is preaching, and all the crowds, they all want to be with Jesus, so they press in on him. Jesus doesn't have any space, personal space. Uh, everybody's all up in it. And so he asks Peter, he gets on the boat and says, Peter, pull away from the shore for a little bit, a little, little while, and, and let me preach. Well, this must have been super irritating for Peter, I would think, even this uh, request. He'd been skunked. I'm a fisherman myself, and I've heard that when you get skunked, you're not in the greatest mood. Um, so after his sermon, Jesus tells Peter, not asks Peter, tells Peter, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. So in order to fill this out, um, bear with me, I'm going to give you a little bit of what's going on in the context of this kind of fishing that Peter was doing uh, and, and all the fishing that happened in Jesus' time. P Jesus is not just asking Peter to like switch up a fly or change out rods. So much more was involved because Peter would have been using trammel nets. Now a trammel net was huge. Um, yards, and yards and yards and yards and yards and yards of net. Um, they were super heavy. They required two very burly men, um, sometimes three, to use the net. They were woven so that um, the mesh was larger on the outside and in descending order so that big fish could swim in and then finally they would get caught. Well, they fished at night. Did you notice they'd been fishing all night long? Why did they fish at night? So the fish couldn't see the net. Uh, otherwise, if they saw the net, they'd swim away. But if they can't see the net, in they go. Now, um, the nets in the morning, after you've been fishing all night long, had to be brought up to the beach as they were in the, in the text. They had to be thoroughly cleaned, which would have been a pain. They had to be mended 
because if there was any difficulty in the net or tearing, then the fish would get away. So this was um, a laborious and painstaking profession, fishing was, requiring long hours, maximum effort just to fish. And then when you came up empty, um, that also meant they weren't fishing for fun. Um, they, there was a serious economic hit to an empty net. These people made their livelihood uh, by hauling in fish and selling to the market. So when the, when the fish was, the net was empty, so was, so was their, their uh, financial gain. So Peter would have been in a bad mood uh, that morning, especially when Jesus, the carpenter, tells Peter, the fisherman, to put out into the deep water. So what would have had to happen? So he would have had to go back to the shore. He would have had to get the nets, probably all nice and folded, and bring them back out into the boat. And um, he would have to find his partner. Who knows where's his partner? Because he couldn't do this by himself. And get in the boat. He must have been totally exhausted from working all night. And he knew there were no fish to be caught. No fish at all. And yet Jesus is asking him to do this. Well, he could have said, maybe should have said, is like, well, like, I'm, I've worked all night, and, you know, Jesus, um, a trammel net works at night, not during the day. So, good idea, but not going to work with a trammel net. I, you know, respectfully, you know a lot how, how to build a table, and you can clearly preach. You don't know a full thing about fishing. So, um, but instead... He says, Master, we've worked all night, caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. We don't know the tone of voice in which he said that. that but, but I don't know. If you have teenagers, you might guess. I don't know how he said it. So. so what I'm saying is that Peter knew, knew that this was a hopeless venture. Just knew it. Back to you. Can't you relate to this? I mean, isn't there something that you just know is worthless to do, that is a hopeless case, someone, maybe even yourself, that just feels hopeless, like there's no, there's no good to be gained by trying this one more time. Because you've toiled and you've toiled and you've toiled and your net's been empty, um, and like, why bother trying again? And yet, in this passage, what did Peter find out? He found out this. What he was sure he knew, he did not know. What he was sure he knew, he did not know. Why? Because Jesus was in his boat. He knew it was impossible to catch fish. And yet, look where they got. There's another place where Jesus said, all right, humanly speaking, I'll grant you, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. They caught so many fish that the nets were beginning to break. They caught so many fish that they had to call the sons of Zebedee to bring their boat over to pile the fish into. And even then, there were so many fish that the boat almost sank, both of them. These were boats probably 25 feet long. They were seven feet wide. They were working boats. They weren't cruising boats. They were like crabbing dead risers, except um, they were even bigger. How many thousands of fish would fit in two boats? up to the top so that it would almost sink. Thousands of fish. They had something like a tilapia, a carp, some kind of herring that they would catch back then. All of it in the boats. So the first takeaway from this story and this sermon is this. In a hopeless situation, what you think you know, you don't know. You do not know. That's because Jesus is in your boat. And you have no clue with him in there, what is going to happen. So after this absurd haul of fish, which, by the way, of course, would have had dollar signs ringing in Peter's eyes, like, oh, my gosh. Um, whoa, this is a windfall. Um, what does he say? What does he do? Well, the text says this. He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. It's the second 
response of Peter today, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. What is happening in that response? First, Jesus, uh, Peter was a Jew, so he would have been taught that no one come in, can come in into the presence of God and live. Our own sinfulness in our nature and God's holiness is so, um, the, the dichotomy, the contrast is so great that you can't see God's holiness in your sin and live. Um, extra biblical, some Jewish sources report that the high priest, you've probably heard this before, would uh, before entering the curtain once a year on the Day of Atonement, behind the curtain into the Holies of Holies, would have to have a, a rope tied around his ankle because in his sinful nature, were he to encounter the presence of God, even though he were making sacrifices for the sins of his people, were he to die, then you wouldn't want the assistant to go in and have the same fate happen. So the assistant would then pull uh, the priest out, the carcass of the priest out. So, Peter is experiencing Jesus here in this, this kind of way. Remember, he says, Master, in the first response. In the second response, he says, Lord. He's like, what is going on with this man? Peter had, uh, sorry, Jesus, the scripture reports earlier in Luke, had um, healed his mother-in-law, for which he may or may not have been thankful. Uh, I told that at the nine with my mother-in-law right there. So, um, <laughs> but when he, when he sees what Jesus has done with the catch of fish, when he knew it was a hopeless situation, he's in awe. He and the others are in awe. And so um, he, he falls down. He gets worried that in his sin... He's not worthy to be in Jesus' sight. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. So much to say about his response. He could have said so many other things that I would have been thinking like, wow, looking at this great haul of fish and all the money it translates to. Uh, Jesus, you should come fishing with us more often. <laughs> um, he cut, he'd been thinking about his money uh, with one quick morning work. He, he could afford a new boat, new nets, maybe a crew. Wouldn't have to go out at night. He could just take Jesus there in the morning. And uh, he was on easy street. And that's how I'd be thinking. But instead, he says, go away. Go away from me, Lord. Don't come back again. Don't, co don't step foot in this boat again. Now, here's what I want to say that's profound. Peter, Jesus gave everything Peter was working for and more. Everything he wanted, everything he thought he needed, he hit the jackpot. Um, and yet, he tells Jesus to go away. Why? This is the segue. Because Peter must have known that our deepest need, it's not all the things that we think we need, like security or wealth or health or money, or success, things that we trade on in this world. He must have known that we don't actually need those things. What we actually need, what we need in the deepest way, is absolution from our sin, the forgiveness of sins. Depart from me, I'm a sinful man. That's the problem that cannot get solved. Remember, the Scripture teaches that sin isn't just what we do, like little sins here, little sins there. It is a congenital disease in us as human beings that 100% ends in death. Romans tells us the wages of sin is death. Somehow, Peter knew that the carpenter in his boat was also the Lamb of God, who takes away his sin, who takes away the sin of the world. He left everything to follow him, the Scripture says. Maybe he did this because this message of absolution, the forgiveness of sin, was the message that the world needed to hear. Maybe they used the money from the Hall of Fish to support this mission. Who knows? 
But what is true for them back there is true for you and me now. Your deepest need is the forgiveness of sin. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Well, lo and behold, Jesus did not depart from Peter. He did the opposite, and that would have overturned all of the religious structures and mores and expectations of the world that sinners cannot uh, approach uh, the holiness of God. But Jesus does the opposite. He comes to rather than departs from sinners. He eats with them. He drinks with them. He parties with them. He hangs with them. He is with them. And in a bizarre irony, it's not Jesus who departs from Peter, but Peter who departs from Jesus. Peter flees when Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Three times he denies any acquaintance with this man who's given him the biggest haul of fish in his life. Peter was nowhere near the hill of Calvary, where Jesus was crucified for his sins, your sins, my sins, the world's sins. I've said that we, what we're sure we know about the situations in our life, we don't know. We do not know, because Jesus is in the boat. But what we do know is this. On the cross, he has addressed our deepest need. You are absolved, and you are forgiven. Amen. Please stand as we respond to this gospel message with the words of the Nicene Creed, beginning on page 326 of your prayer books. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please kneel for our prayers of the people. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men. Receive these our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord. And grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, that they may, both by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. 
And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, especially Joe, our president, Glenn, our governor, and Lloyd, the mayor of our city, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Amen. As we remain kneeling, let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God using the form on the bottom of page 331. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved thee with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways. To the glory of thy name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him. Have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. This is a true saying and worthy of all to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Please stand. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Very warm welcome to Christ Church uh, this morning. Please be seated when you've had a chance to greet one another. If you're new to Christ Church, we're so happy you're here and invite you to fill out one of the newcomer cards that you'll find in the pew. Put it into the usher's plate as it goes by. And um, on that note, we are starting something new. We're doing a newcomer open house on Zoom uh, the first Monday of the month, which is tomorrow from 12 to 1. Uh, find, you can find the link in your bulletin. You would have, if you fill out one of the cards, Courtney would have sent one to you. If you just feel newish, uh, then you get on the website and find that link as well. We invite everybody to hop on uh, to that um, information and welcome session. Next week is the Super Bowl, and we make Super Bowl chili. Our, our youth group does. It's super good. Done this for years and years and years, and all the proceeds go to support our youth mission trip, which we'll have this summer. So see the information about that. Um, youth confirmation began uh, at the 10 o'clock hour today for 8th and 9th graders and some 10th graders, since it's been a while since we've been able to have confirmation. Uh, had a great start, lots and lots of kids, but if you know of someone, you are someone in that age group would like to be confirmed, then see the information there. Talk to Josh or Lizzie. Uh, and uh, we continue with our communion to do communion in one kind, so 
just uh, come receive the host and then um, there's no wine. Uh, but if you'd like to come and receive a blessing, you can cross your arms across your chest. And then finally, it's just super big joy to announce that Sam Bush and his wife Maddie and two children, Auden and Elliot, will be coming back to join our staff. He was our youth minister, our music minister here for 10 years and will graduate Duke Seminary and be ordained and he'll join our clergy team starting June the 1st. So i um, super happy about that. Now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
Our service of Holy Communion now continues with the words of the Great Thanksgiving, beginning on page 333 of your prayer books. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto Thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, because in the mystery of the Word made flesh, Thou hast caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of Thy glory in the face of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify Thy glorious name, evermore praising Thee and saying, All glory be to Thee, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, for that Thou of Thy tender mercy didst give Thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by His one oblation of Himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute, and in His holy gospel command us to continue, a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood, of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we thy humble servants do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit, these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, 
Yet we beseech thee to accept this, our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Please kneel for our post-communion prayer, which you'll find printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank Thee for that Thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of Thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of Thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members in corporate and the mystical body of Thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you forever. Amen. We stand for our closing hymn, Ye Servants of God, Your Master. Proclaim hymn number 535 in your blue hymnal.